last class we studied radiation. Uh, we began to study gravitational radiation. We looked at a wave propagating the x direction. Okay, its momentum wave vector was minus k k zero zero zero. This was let's say k mu. And uh, um, we found that uh, we found uh, to start with we we worked with this this quantity right this. Mm, this quantity psi, psi mn, which was equal to h mn um, minus half delta mn h. Okay. Um, and in the end, what we found was that, uh, um, so we looked for solutions of the form psi mn is equal to epsilon mn e to the power i k dot x. Okay, and uh, in the end what we found was that epsilon 1 1 was equal to epsilon 1 0 was equal to epsilon 0 1 was equal to epsilon 0 0 was equal to 0. What, sorry? Well, actually both psi and h. If you remember we found that h was 0. Yeah, so psi mn, h mn. Psi mn was, was, was this form. And uh, epsilon a b was equal to zero. Uh, a, a was equal to zero. Um, but epsilon, the traceless and symmetric part of epsilon, thought of as 2 cross 2, 2 cross 2 transverse tensor, was completely undetermined. And that gave us two polarizations of the, of the graviton. Uh, although this is not the main focus of our course, had we done this, nowhere in this exercise did we use the fact that we were working in four dimensions, except in letting the indices a, b run from one to two. Uh, if we'd repeated this whole exercise in arbitrary number of dimensions, we would have got the same result, except that the indices a, b would have run from one to d minus two. So in a, in a general d-dimensional space time, our Graviton would be characterized by a d minus 2 dimension, traceless symmetric. So, in line with the general expectations from this little group analysis that I that we vaguely discussed last class. Okay, any questions about that? So how a linearized gravitational wave behaves. Now, of course, we found one gravitational wave. Uh, with the direction k. But because we were dealing with the linearized theory, we can now superpose. Okay, so we've got a zillion, a zillions of you know, arbitrary linear superposition of these waves. We found in general, the most general linearized solution of Einstein gravity around flat space. So the problem of linearizing Einstein gravity around flat space, though, uh, though in you know, in a slightly ugly way because of all these choice of gauges and so on. We've solved, okay? Uh, we've solved the most general problem of linearizing outside gravity about flat space. This is, ex this is the analog of solving Maxwell's equations in the absence of matter. Now, in the case of Maxwell's equations, the solution is exact because Maxwell's equations are linear equations. In the absence of matter, once you found one photon, you found them all. Or one electromagnetic wave, we found them all because you can linearly superpose, and that's it. And there's nothing more to do uh, in the linearized theory. Einstein's equations, on the other hand, are nonlinear. Okay? And so, while linearizing is great, you might wonder whether we can take this linearized uh, solution and correct it to include nonlinear effects. Okay? Now, once we go about trying something like that, we can, superposition will no longer work, okay? So if we want, we want to aim for a non-linearization, we have to know what we're going to aim to non-linearize, okay? So w in the beginning of this class, what we're going to try to do is to find a non-linear version of exactly this solution, namely a solution moving in a particular direction, okay? While this linearized thing has the great advantage of superposition, 
what, what we're going to be able, what we're going to try to do now is a particular solution which you will not be able to superpose except when things are far away. Okay. See, you know, if, if you were, uh, most nonlinear problems in physics cannot be solved exactly. And uh, if you were pragmatic, you would say, well, I'm a physicist, what I can do is perturbation theory and start with the solution and perturb. However, this, is a, this case is an exception to the rule. In this case, you can solve the problem exactly. Uh, and it's quite a simple and beautiful solution. And I'm going to explain it. Okay? So, uh, this is going to be another example of an exact solution of Einstein's equations in vacuum uh, that, we, that we will, that we know. Okay. So, see, this wave is moving in the direction eta. Uh, sorry, is it moving in the direction, let's say, x, it's also moving in time. Now, when we're dealing with light-like things, it's convenient to move to coordinates x plus t plus x, let's call it x, uh, yeah, t plus x, let's call it, no, I'll, I'll follow Landau Lifshitz. <laughs> let's call it, I think he calls it eta. And then in a very irritating way he calls, maybe, maybe does he have a root? Theta. And t minus x by square root 2, instead of using some other nice civilized Greek letter which nobody can pronounce, uh, he calls it x1. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, he does this because the way he solves it, he doesn't even realize that these, were these, these are what the coordinates are until the end of his answer. But we're going to use physical foresight and, you know, be dealing with these. Uh, it, okay, so what I'm going to do is to aim to find a solution in these coordinates. So the first thing we're going to do is to look at what the linearized solution becomes in these coordinates. So what is the linearized solution? Firstly, what is flat space in these coordinates? All right, let, let me not be so obvious. I'll call this chi, okay? So um, what is flat space, <laughs> uh, what does flat space solution become in these coordinates? Well, 2D chi. sorry? Uh, 2D chi. 2 d ta d chi, exactly. Uh, exactly. So minus 2 d eta d chi plus dx a dx a. This is clear because we've used the identity where a plus b into a minus b is a square minus b square. Uh, so that's dt square minus dx1 square, or minus dx square. And then the 2 is needed and the minus. Is this clear? So flat space can equally be equally well be written in this way if we went to these coordinates. Okay? And in these coordinates, what was our h? Our h was, so, so if we write the full metric, we have this plus h a b, only h a b. Okay, uh, times, now I could say e to the power i, um, I could say e to the power i k dot x, but that's e to the power i omega, let's say eta, omega is k, okay. maybe up to square root, uh, up to a renormalization of what I mean by k. No, for this, at the, in our solution, this is only a solution when HAB is small. I'm just writing, so plus order H. I'm just rewriting our old solution, which was valid only for HAB small. Uh, and you want plus, plus, uh, plus complex conjugate? That, that, that would be, yeah, plus complex, sure. Okay, yeah, what? And times, uh, uh, times dx a dx b. 
You're right. Thank you, everyone. Plus or epsilon. Okay, this is the metric we looked at. And we're going to try to find a nonlinear generalization of this metric. Okay? In fact, what we're going to be able to do is to find a nonlinear generalization of not just this guy with a constant momentum, but with arbitrary k, provided only that this k moves in the same eta direction. Okay? So we're going to be able to find a nonlinear generalization of the most general way of moving in the x direction. Okay, now if we were to be able to find uh, an arbitrary uh, generalization of this, then by taking linear combinations of this, I can write down an arbitrary function of eta. So now I can get rid of Pronoy's <laughs> complex conjugate and write epsilon plus epsilon a b of eta dx a dx b. Noting that epsilon a b is symmetric at distance. This was also a solution because by superposition I can make any epsilon a b that's symmetric and traceless. By Fourier's theorem, right? I mean any reasonable function can be written uh, in Fourier space. So we've already shown that these are all solutions. Of course, we've shown many more solutions because we can also superwave whose waves moving in the y direction, in the z direction. But we're going to forget those for now. So this is the solution we're going to try to find a nonlinear generalization. Okay? So motivated by this way of thinking, what we're going to do is to try to look for an ansatz which will solve Einstein's equations such that the s squared is equal to minus 2 d eta d chi plus, okay, plus g a b of chi dx a and just because we can, we're going to try to generalize answers a little bit, just because we can, to just be a bit fancy. You'll see that fanciness will go away very soon. Uh, plus G A, it's a stupid name, it's got that name. Anyway, uh, uh, Landau Lipschitz calls it G A, which I think find a very bad name, but anyway. Uh, Where this d, I had chosen everything to be a function of eta, oh sorry, eta. Then this, I will allow a d chi here. You might ask, why do I allow this? Okay, uh, you know, I'm just trying to make, I'm trying to be more general. If I find such a solution, I certainly find a generalization of this solution, which is a solution without this. You know, just being as general as I can. Okay, very soon we'll find that this generality will go away. In fact, we'll see it, see it right now. Okay, so if, you, if, you, if your instinct was to try to general, this is very natural, right? To find GAB of eta times dx a dx b. I put this extra thing, this slight generalization of the ansatz. Uh, it's not going to be very important. So if your instinct was to try to generalize without this, go ahead, you get the same answer. All right. So now, what we, what we, what's very important here, sorry, everything is here. Everything here is a function of only one, one variable. Okay. That is what's going to give us all the simplicity. That everything here is a function of exactly one variable. This is an answer. Okay. This is generalizing this fact that everything here was a function of only one variable. Now, you see, what, what was the point? The point was that if you try to find a nonlinear generalization of this, then it's going to preserve all the symmetries that this solution preserves. 
In particular, this solution preserves symmetries in translations in chi and translations in the axis, also in rotations in the axis. Okay? So clearly, if we want a nonlinear generalization of the solution, we should look for an answer that preserves all those symmetries. The way you're going to preserve translations in chi and translations in the axis is to have none of your free functions depending on chi's or x's. Okay? So th this is the basic idea for why we're going to choose some nonlinear ansatz in which, um, in which, sorry, I said rotations in x's, yeah, that's wrong. Is, it's, it's, it's not the rotations in x's is broken by this and will in general be broken by this as well. So I said that wrong, sorry. Just the translations. Okay? And uh, th therefore, we just want to preserve this, uh, these, these symmetries that we'll get by having everything independent of uh, uh, everything independent of chi and x's. Every free function independent of chi and x's. Okay. Um, fine. We could discuss this ansatz a little more, but let's not do that. Let's let's go run with it. It seems quite natural, and see what we get. Okay. So now what we want to do is take this ansatz and plug it into Einstein's equations. So in order to do that, what we need to do is to find, um, what we need to do is to find the curvature uh, uh, in the solution. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, now we have two options we can calculate or you can, we can leave it as an exercise. You guys get to vote. Would you, would you like us to spend the 15 minutes calculating it or would you like to do it as an exercise? Exercise. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> okay. So I'm. So x1. If you compute R, A, B on this solution. Remember, A, B are these transverse directions. Okay. Uh, so you compute R, A, B on the solution. Now, firstly, um, what? This, this, this G A at the moment I've not even used upper and lower. This is just some G A. There's no nothing defined other than G A. But if if you have to, you'll raise and lower with G A. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, uh, let's look at what we can say about this this uh, um, about this R A B. Um, you know, let's look at what we what we can say about this RAB. Uh, I'm going to give you the answer, and then we'll look at one or two properties of it. So RAB is equal to claim minus half GAC GC dot GBD GD dot. Dot is with respect to the yeah the variable that is in the problem. Okay, now why is this this formula reasonable? This is something you're going to compute. Okay, but why is it reasonable? The first thing is that if suppose these guys were zero. Okay, then you see on any given slice of a b, this metric is a constant. Okay, so it's perhaps intuitive and you can convince yourself, it's obviously true, that then this RAB would vanish. This RAB is now non-vanishing because of the mixing, of this mixing term here. Okay, and it's non-vanishing only when this mixing term depends on eta because curvatures are non-vanishing, you know, always vanishing when things are constants. Okay, so it's not, uh, RAB is too derivative. So it's not too unreasonable that it's gc dot gd dot and then that's the structure. So it's not an unreasonable structure. But anyway, I'll leave it for you as an exercise to check carefully that it's true. We could probably, if we thought about it for 10 minutes, argue that this had to take this form in some clever way. Okay, if you wanted to solve your exercise by doing that argument, it would be great. 
okay but it's a very reasonable structure for this for this answer today now we expect this GAB to be a metric that is positive definite right because um, we expect our metric to have signature three pluses and one minus this guy already has signature one plus one minus so we should expect this JAB to have signa all signatures pluses. But um, you see this quantity here. Oh, actually, it's even easier. Yeah. So uh, it, let let's call this quantity eta theta. This quantity, this RAB here is theta A, theta B. Okay. How, if RAB is theta A, theta B and RAB vanishes, the only way it can do it is if theta A and theta B both vanish. I mean, theta A vanishes. Clearly. Because R11 must vanish, so theta 1 squared must vanish. Therefore, theta 1 vanishes. R22 must vanish, and so on. Okay. I mean, okay. Good. So this quantity is, is, is Einstein's equation tell us, tells us that this quantity is zero. This implies theta is equal to zero, which means GBD, you know, this quantity is zero. But because this metric is non-degenerate, it means this quantity is zero. Okay, and so we come to the conclusion that uh, though we try to be fancy, the fanciness didn't buy us anything because we have GC dot is equal to zero. So if GC dot is equal to zero, this means that this GA is not a function of is not a function of eta, it's just a constant. But if that is the case, then the coordinate change XA till xa is equal to xa minus ga chi gets rid of gas from the metric okay so we might as well work with those coordinates to start with so the coordinate was not there uh, so this ga was not there so we conclude that the form, the ansatz we should have started with is what, I don't know, maybe a reasonable person would have started with anyway. Okay? So this is our ansatz for the, for this, uh, or for our wave. It's certainly a very nice generalization of this, where that GAB is one plus, where in the linearized case, GAB is one plus eta AB. Is this clear? Okay, except. Now, we wanna know when this guy is a solution. We've already checked the RABs. Um, we've already checked that the RABs are uh, uh, vanish on this. So what's left is R eta A, R chi A, R eta eta, R chi eta, and so on. Okay. Exercise. Check. Check or argue that the only non-zero And that okay. So okay. In, in doing this check, you will find it useful to note that the non-zero, the only non-zero gammas are.
I'll tell you what KAB is in a minute. And of course, you know, the other gammas that are related to this by, by symmetry are also non-zero. But these are the only two non-trivial non-zero guys. Okay? Uh, so you'll find it useful to use this piece of information. And then you get Re theta is equal to minus half kappa AB minus 1 by 4 kappa BA. This, this must be a. Fine. Where kappa kappa uh, a b is equal to g a b dot and kappa a b is equal to what? what you were saying, it's raised with GBC, kappa C A. You know, some of this, this, this structure when we study in the more topic C part of our course, which hopefully we'll start from next semester, okay? When we study uh, uh, the canonical formulation, the ADM formalism of general relativity, we'll see some of these things you, you wouldn't have to derive. You would know from some general theorem. This form is, Extrinsic curvature minus square of extrinsic curvature appears a lot, and we'll, we will encounter it again. But for now, it's a good idea for you to just derive it. Okay, check that it's true. Okay? It is very much like the extrinsic curvature, at least. Because you see, we've got a, a slice, and uh, yeah, it's very, if you, it's, to, to, to be extrinsic curvature, I have to tell you extrinsic curvature of what slice. But let's say we take the slices of constant eta, <coughs> then it is the extrinsic. Okay, yeah. So uh, if we set up a formalism in which we did evolution in the eta direction, then this would be extrinsic curvature. And this, this would essentially be the Hamiltonian constraint equation. Yes, uh, uh, do, do you know if you're dimensionally like uh, this R eta eta term? Uh, because there's only one P, uh, one kappa here and sort of two kappas here. This does not look dimensionally right. Let me uh, think about that. Uh, let me think about that. Let me think about that. First, let me run the check. Uh, yeah, where do the dimensions go? This is a good question. Yeah, uh, sorry, normally, how does it go? This is a good question. Is it squared? Is it squared? Just a minute. Is it trace k squared minus k the whole thing? Just, just a minute. Yeah, th you're right, there's something wrong here because there's only one time derivative. So this had to have two time, de time derivatives. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. What appears in the Hamiltonian constraint? Just give me, give me a minute. I don't think Landau Lipschitz has, does anyone remember? Is it K square? Just, just, just one second.
give me a minute. I'll see if these guys have. OK, we'll figure out what, what the issue is when we start using it but, uh, in the worst case. But see, I, I can't remember if Lander Lipschitz deals with. Probably not, right? Uh, that would have been the easy way to check. Am I mistaking something? Just one minute. Which one? This K A K term. maybe come from the Riemann. Uh, You're saying it's in uh, uh, the Ricci scalar. Yeah. Uh, so what you are saying is that maybe it's an E E E type. Is that right? Yeah. Do you want to check this? Let's let's check it. Let's let's just derive it, okay? Since we're we're not sure. And I will wait for this in second derivative. Uh, what? Well, if if yeah, certainly if we were computing e eta eta, uh, we would not. But you know, if the only non-zero, if the claim is true that this is the only non-zero Einstein uh, curvature then the r should also be proportional to this. So, e, so, so there shouldn't be second derivatives. What? Uh, because delay of gamma a eta eta is one term, but gamma a eta eta is zero. Okay, let's derive it. Let's check it. Okay, so le uh, let's 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 start by writing down the uh, uh, the formula for the uh, for R A B. Let's remind ourselves first about the formula for R alpha beta. Okay, can somebody open? Can one of you give me the formula? Okay, so there is of course, yeah. Okay, does somebody want to quote the formula for me? The one with the the four terms, the square root g, the one we've used many times. You have it? Okay, sorry. Okay, and in this formula we had a simplification, and that again you. Rem okay, great. So now we're in business. Let's just let's just roll and see what we get. Okay, so we want r eta eta. So here we in this term we want eta eta. And we have to check um, this guy. This one was our chi, right? I just hmm. Nothing but eta depends on eta. Let me just. <coughs> I think zero is his eta, and one is his chi. So, yeah. So, firstly, there are no. There's <coughs> nothing with two indices with eta. So this term is zero. 
So this term is zero. Now, what about this? This looks good. We have minus half del eta square. This is the term you were talking about. But let's see. Uh, log of uh, the metric. Now, log of the metric in this case is clearly uh, log of g. Right? OK, great. Then there is plus. Now we want to get, how do we want? This guy, was this new new? Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. So uh, this term is zero. And uh, in this term here, we want two etas down. Now we have to be careful because raising and lowering chi's turns chi's into etas. Okay? So what we want here is minus, oh, but we don't care about that because we're going to be raising and lowering the, um, yeah, but still. So what we want is a gamma eta, and then if we've got an eta, there's no chi, so it's AB gamma eta AB. This is what we want. So we want two gammas with lower etas. Two gammas with lower etas. Oh, these are probably the same formula. Uh, let's check the consistency of these two formulas. Uh, let me check. The, what do I mean by that? I uh, see. If um, Just a minute. No, no, these are different forms. Because these are the two special indices. Yeah. So these are the two special. Anyway, so, so, so it's only this formula that plays any role. Right? Uh, and so we get minus k. K B K B K B K B A by four. As both of you were saying, yeah, so you're right. So, uh, and this term here is um, uh, so now we want G. So we get half uh, del eta squared log g. Now, um, with, a minus sign, with a minus sign. Now, let's take this, this log g. Uh, let's take the first derivative. So that's minus half del eta uh, g a b. Let's see, a b uh, dot times g a b. Right, because we take the, the uh, derivative of uh, yeah, that's that looks good. Okay, um, so far this, and then we take this this de this derivative a second time. Okay, this is a and this is ah, this is k. Thank you. So that's minus half k a, a dot. A, a dot. Okay, absolutely. Both of you were right. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry for that. Uh, I wonder. I wonder. Uh, give me one minute more. I'm 
confused about something, but let, let it be. You guys are certainly right. We've checked it by explicit calculation. You guys are certainly right, so we've got KE dot. Thank you. OK, we can remove this part of the exercise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can check the others. <laughs> OK. As you see, the exercise, I mean, it's fine minute job. <laughs> OK. Great. So now, what is the main point? The, re the really important point is this, that we had in our ansatz three unknown functions of eta. Because they were GABs of eta. And G was a 2 cross 2 te uh, symmetric tensor. So far, no, no mention of its trace. Yeah. OK. But we've got only one equation for these three unknown components, which means we're going to have two free functions. Does that sound sort of first order, right? It does, because at linearized order, we had two free functions. Because each of the epsilons was an arbitrary free function. OK? So it's sounding good. Now, in order to process this further, what we're going to do is to do this. See, at linearized order, the trace played a special role. So we're going to do the following. What we'll do is to say, let our GA beam be equal to chi times gamma AB. OK? And we will choose gamma to have determinant 1. This guy is not the same coordinate as? No, we call it something else. OK, and then we plug that into this equation. So let's rewrite this equation in terms of, uh, in terms of the g's. Um, so what we had was uh, kab was equal to gab dot. But now we've got gab is equal to, uh, so kab is equal to zeta gamma ab dot, uh, which is equal to zeta dot gamma ab plus uh, uh, zeta gamma ab dot. OK. Now, um, what about kab? OK, so KAB, um, let's, let us define, let me see. Yeah, let, let us just keep all factors of gamma AB, including upper gamma AB, is explicit. So KAB was equal to um, KAM GMB was by definition. So this is equal to zeta dot gamma AB plus zeta gamma AB dot times, now we have 1 by zeta times gamma MB because the inverse of uh, the inverse of uh, uh, G is 1 by zeta times inverse of gamma because G is zeta times gamma. Okay? And so this is equal to zeta dot by zeta gamma AB plus gamma AB. Uh, yes, I think I wanted an M here because I wanted the whole thing with a B. Thank you. So this is gamma. Uh, yeah. Now this quantity is just delta AB, right? Because 
gamma a m gamma a m. So that's just delta a b. Okay, and this quantity is gamma dot a a b, which we will understand to be gamma a b raised with gamma. Okay, so great. So we know what these quantities are, and we know what this quantity is. So now we just have to plug it. So let's take the first quantity. So we want this thing traced. So we have zeta dot by zeta and then we trace this quantity. So in four dimensions we'll get a two plus gamma a m gamma m b uh, gamma m a dot. That's the first term. And we want it with a minus half. Okay. Then we get a minus 1 by 4 times the square of these two terms. So zeta dot by zeta. So let's call this, okay, zeta dot by zeta. Um, we call it I. Okay, fine. Delta A M gamma A B M into zeta dot by zeta delta M A plus right plus gamma M B dot. Right. Now we uh, open all these things out. So this and there was a dot on top of this. D by D. Okay. So now we, we have some opening out to do. Um, okay, let's do it. Let's simplify this bottom term first. So this, this times this is 2. This is trace of identity. And it's zeta dot squared by zeta squared. So that's minus, so this bottom term is minus half zeta dot squared by zeta squared. Then let's look at these cross terms. The cross terms are the same. That's correct. So we we'll get again a minus half times uh, plus zeta dot by zeta um, gamma a m dot gamma a m. Trace of yeah, but that's that's what this is, right? Because that's what gamma a m dot was. Let me remind you. Gamma a m dot was equal to gamma a b dot gamma b m, and then you trace it. Okay, I'm writing it just to make sure we understand what it means. Okay. And then we get the product of these two terms. So let's write this out also carefully. So this was uh, plus gamma A C gamma C M gamma M D dot gamma D D 
A because we're trace, uh, tracing it out, right? Yeah. A C C M. That looks good. Half. Uh, because it's you're right. Okay, so that was this term. Now what about this term here? Okay, now this term had various terms. You see, this d by d, let's, let's first look at, so let's look at this term here. So that's minus eta double dot by eta. That's where the dot hits this guy. Okay. Plus, Eta dot squared by eta squared. But what was this? Zeta. Eta. It's, it's probably zeta. Zeta squared. Zeta dot squared by zeta squared. Okay. Then minus half gamma am double dot gamma m a okay and uh, minus half now here we have to keep our wits about us this will become a plus because it acts on what do we use we use that uh, uh, dg inverse times g is equal to minus or plus uh, g inverse dg is equal to 0. So derivative of this is minus, yeah. So we, we made this a plus and then we get uh, gamma a m dot times um, gamma m n gamma n q dot gamma q a is that good Okay, now we have to group all terms together. Mm. Okay. So let's do the grouping. First the zeta double dot term is um, minus z double dot uh, by zeta. Then the zeta dot square term and then, okay, now the zeta dot square term had a, a here but it also came with a minus half here. So this comes with a half. Then a zeta dot gamma dot term plus zeta dot minus half zeta dot by zeta gamma am dot gamma am. Now, uh, this quantity is the derivative of the determinant of gamma. 
But we know that by definition, the determinant of gamma is 1. So this quantity is not there. Right? So this quantity was 0. So that, that quantity is not there. And then finally, we have, uh, oh, then we've got this, this, this double derivative term, which is minus half. And then finally, we have minus quarter plus half, so plus quarter. Uh, I'll write this, you know, as trace of what is it? Gamma dot, gamma inverse, gamma dot, gamma inverse. You know what I mean, right? Which, which term? This term, it's 0 by itself because the tr determinant of gamma is 0. Then you do that in a first line. First line, second line. Oh, you're absolutely right. So then, oh. But where does the derivative go? Yeah, exactly. That's why. But total is 0. No, but it's a quantity, it's 0. No, wait a minute. Something's. Something's wrong. Just a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did I did I make a mistake? Sorry. Just a minute. Uh, I think you're right, actually. I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're right. Thank you. Thank you. We could have just done it at this stage. I th thank you very much. We could have just did done it at this stage. And so everything that we get, thank you very much. Uh, this was also true. Yeah. So everything that we get from here is just this, uh, this minus one fourth term. Yeah, you're right. You're right. The fact that the determinant is zero meant that these two by themselves were also zero. Thank you very much. Yes. So it's just that one, sorry, so. So you're absolutely right. And uh, that will be minus one fourth. And this is minus one fourth. Excellent. So if we've done it right, and now we have to look at, check with Landau Lipschitz. We've got zeta double, zeta double dot, thank you. Uh, minus zeta double dot plus Let's say minus 2 zeta double dot plus zeta dot squared. And multiply, let's multiply everything by 4. 4 zeta double plus 2 zeta dot squared minus trace gamma, gamma inverse, gamma dot, gamma inverse, gamma dot, gamma inverse is equal to 0. Oops, not good. Uh, Landau Lipschitz has firstly he has a factor of eight between this term and this term. And secondly, he does not have Secondly, he does not have this term. Okay. Somewhere we messed up. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the. Oh, he for doesn't the mess have up. the trace term? No, he has the trace term. He doesn't have this term. He has this term, but with a different factor. With a relative factor of 8. Let me see the plus minus sign. Mm. Ah. 
I'm sorry for this. Let's, let's, let's go through this once again. The relative sign is plus. So, he, okay, we've got the relative sign wrong, we've got the relative factor wrong, and we've got an extra term. The extra term is a real embarrassment. Uh, let's, let's, let's go through that again. I'm sorry, people. Let's, let's track this down. I forgot to write the zeta squared in the denominator. Yeah, so this was zeta squared and this was zeta. And let's check if it's got what is going on here. Yeah, okay. That he has right. Yeah, he has the zeta on that side. It's just that this term is not there. And there's a factor of two we made, I think. Uh, let, me, let me think about it just one minute. Um, wait, let me check his equations from the beginning. Ah, ah, sorry, his zeta is not the same as our zeta. But <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, that, 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 that's right. So now let us be, let's, let's stop. This, uh, we're right, we're right, I think we're right. Let's, two, two zeta dot squared by zeta squared. Okay, and now let's do the following uh, clever change of variables. <laughs> that, uh, zeta is equal to alpha squared. <laughs> okay, what is the point? The point is if we do this change of variables, let's look at this. Okay, we'll get, firstly, what about the alpha double dot term? That'll come with a minus eight alpha double dot uh, times alpha by alpha uh, by alpha square. Okay, but there's an extra term. The extra term is when? Alpha dot. Exactly. Uh, the extra term is when uh, uh, we, we get each of the alphas being hit by a dot. The first dot could hit either one of the two alphas. And then the second dot hits, so there's a factor of two. So that's uh, plus, um, minus two alpha dot squared by alpha squared. Into four, thank you, into four, that, that, that is what it's missing. It's a minus eight. Okay, and then here we also get a factor of eight because there was two and then there's alpha squared, so each derivative picks up an additional factor of two. So plus eight alpha dot squared by alpha squared. You see it becomes alpha dot squared alpha, alpha dot alpha, the whole thing squared, and then becomes alpha to the four, so that cancels. So this cancels, okay, minus trace gamma dot gamma inverse gamma dot gamma inverse okay fine and so the final equation is uh, 8 alpha double dot plus alpha times trace gamma dot gamma inverse gamma dot gamma inverse time is equal to zero. Okay. Okay, great. Now we're in business. So, all we have to do is to solve this one equation. So what is the structure of this? We choose an arbitrary gamma. With determinant one. With determinant one. That's the non-linearization of choosing an epsilon with trace zero. Because remember, gamma was the full matrix, including the flat, the, ba the ba background part. And if you take identity plus small, and you take its determinant, that becomes one plus trace. 
So determinant one was the analog of choosing, of, of requiring that the epsilons of our linearized gravitons were traceless. Okay, it's a non-linear analog of that. Okay, but now we've got a much, but nice, much nicer way to say it. What we do is we choose an arbitrary gamma as an arbitrary function of eta. It's, it's traceless, but other than that, no, no constraint. And then once we've got that, we've got a nice linear equation here. Okay, we've got a nice linear equation which we then solve for alpha. That solution then determines the trace part of gamma, trace part of, of GAB. Okay, so you see that we've got a practically solvable because it's linearized the problem. You choose in terms of arbitrary data which we can specify, namely an determinant one to cross two matrix. Uh, we have a practically solvable equation. This is just a linear equation. You solve it, and then uh, you've got uh, you've got uh, you've got your graviton solution. Okay. Now, actually solving this linear equation for any particular choice of uh, a gamma may be tough. But we've linearized the problem. So let us declare that that is essentially a solution. Certainly for specially simple forms of gamma, we would be able to solve it. Okay? How does this reduce to our linearized problem? Well, in the case that we choose gamma in the case that we choose the metric to be linearized, uh, gamma is simply identity. Or it's simply, uh, sorry, gamma is identity plus epsilon, as we discussed, where epsilon is traceless. Now, all of the dots appear, appear on epsilon, but this has two dots. So this is already order epsilon square. So at, order linear, uh, at linearized order, this guy is just zero. Okay? So alpha equals one. Alpha is equal to one is a solution. Alpha equals eta. Uh, alpha equals one is also a solution. Yeah, it's, that's what that's the solution we want, right? <laughs> 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 you know, we want that the determinant. <laughs> we had our old solution, where we had just constant determinant. Right? Yeah, alpha equals eta is a solution, but it will have very strange boundary conditions. You know, yeah, I mean it, it blows it up. Blows. You know, so we, 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 we'll try to look for solutions that reduce to our linearized graviton solution in the limit. But our linearized graviton is clearly a solution. And now we can try to li non linearize that. Okay? Now, if we want to do perturbation theory, This is now very easy. So you start with your arbitrary epsilon, and all you have to do is to find how the determinant, how this alpha evolves, by solving this equation. Okay, and you can do it not just for the plane wave, but for any shape of uh, any shape of gamma. Okay, so exercise. Uh, use this equation. to use this equation to uh, uh, solve for alpha and hence the metric to second order. Okay, this is part one of the exercise. Part two of the exercise is that if you choose eta, choose epsilon of eta to be a localized wave packet. packet, something like this, show that, that um, 
uh, alpha that yeah you know a, a long time you know for some a long time after the passage of this this wave packet in eta okay show that alpha is proportional to eta after the the wave packet passes That the deviation of alpha, so alpha is like alpha, alpha is equal to one minus number times eta. Okay, and so alpha vanishes at finite time. Show that at the point where alpha vanishes. Is a coordinate singularity, but not a genuine singularity. In fact, You know, in fact, this kind of solution, this kind of solution where such a localized wave packet, uh, uh, such a lo uh, localized wave packet passes through, is a solution. If it's if this wave packet goes strictly to zero, the solution is flat space before the wave packet, and flat space in some funny coordinates after the wave packet. Try to explore this. Just patched together by a solution that deviates from flat in the middle. Okay, see if you can see all these features in this. Okay, so in particular, the important thing in point C, first you do the exercise, and then try to understand what happens in the case where the wave packet is strictly localized over some region. Try to convince yourself that the space time is flat before and after. In the limit that this guy is very, Thin, this solution goes over to what's called, sometimes called the Eiselberg somebody shockwave solution. It's a solution in which flat space on one side is patched with flat space on the other. Eiselberg sexel or something like that. Okay, so some shockwave solution. So this this, this 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 solution here is a beautiful solution, and has a particularly simple limit of thin wave packet. Okay. So uh, if we use, for instance, a Gaussian. Yeah. Then, uh, it, wouldn't, uh, work great. it wouldn't work, but if you use a Gaussian and then take the limit width of Gaussian to you know make it like a delta function, hmm. then it would. Okay, but if you use a Gaussian, would it work to very good accuracy as you go far away to the tails of the Gaussian? So just explore the physics of this. Explore the physics of the solution. The solution is actually a beautiful solution, it has a lot of physics in it, and uh, especially the thin. Thin wave limit of it is useful in many, many areas of investigation in theoretical physics. Uh, string theorists, uh, we, you know, were alerted to the usefulness of this uh, in the discussions of causality uh, by a paper that Maldasena and company wrote three years ago. You know, so it's 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 there's there's, there's a lot of physics in this in this the solution. Uh, people often look look at it in special limits, but you can look at it outside these limits. This is Everything we've said is exact. Okay? Uh, fine. Questions or comments? Okay? So what we've done here is, you know, not 100% satisfying because we found the solution up to the solution of a linearized equation. But it's a linearized equation. It's a linear equation. And so, in special, so it's very useful. In particular, in special limits and so on, you can analyze it very easily. So this is almost an exact solution of Einstein's equations. Some moral sense in it because you've linearized a nonlinear non-linear problem, and uh, um, in special limits it becomes genuinely an exact solution of Einstein's equations. In particular, the shock wave, in the shock wave limit, this limit where you choose this wave packet to be very thin. Okay, in the actual assignment that we write up, uh, 
depending on how much more we've got, I may give you a, an additional piece on exactly the thin, thin shock wavelength. Okay, great. This is all I wanted to say about gravitational waves in this uh, Oh, no, no, I have to tell you about the production of gravitation, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, th there's one important thing that we've not talked about so far in our classes. Okay? And that is of the no notion of energy in general relativity. So, something you guys may be wondering is how much energy does this wave carry? This is a very natural question. When you study waves in electromagnetic, uh, a very important feature of these waves is that they carry energy, they carry momentum, and so on. This is a question that we want to know the answer to, and that I will tell you that we will discuss the answer to. But I've avoided at the moment telling you the answer to because a proper discussion of this requires a proper definition of what, a proper discussion of what we mean by energy and momentum in general relativity. Slightly tricky issue, okay? Which I'm postponing to the uh, seminar part. We're going to discuss it in more detail. So when we go through our discussion of what we mean by energy, what, there are many interesting and related notions of energy in general relativity, all of which basically coincide in reasonable situations. And uh, when we go through that discussion, we will also then discuss how much energy this wave is carrying. So that is the main physical lacuna in our discussion of gravitational waves so far. And I'm aware of it, I'm just postponing it to when we've had a proper discussion of Okay, but uh, modulo that this is hmm, sufficient in the sense that you understand what these gravitational waves are and you understand quite remarkably that you can find more or less exact nonlinear solutions of these equations. Okay, great. Now, the next thing, so far we have studied gravitational waves in vacuum. Now, these are great solutions of general relativity, but if we go back to the Maxwell problem, the Maxwell solutions of general relativity, uh, uh, Maxwell solutions of Maxwell's equations, the wave, equ wave solutions of Maxwell's equations were useful, of course, because they were solutions, but more because they were easily produced. You have electrons and antennas, they do this, they produce those waves, okay? And that is the heart of it, right? That's why things produce waves, that's why the, you, we can see things in the universe, okay? So the next question that's of, that is obvious to ask is, in this context, what produces gravitational waves? How are gravitational waves produced? And uh, you know, what is the formula for the production of gravitational waves? Now, in the context of general, uh, of in the context of uh, electromagnetism. You can give a very complete and simple theory of radiation because electromagnetism is easy. Okay. So you take Maxwell's equations, you put an arbitrary conserved current on the, right, on the right hand side and then you integrate those equations. Assume the current is somehow known, God given, There's some electron that is. You're not worrying about how that's it's known. You assume it's known, in terms of that you can solve Maxwell's equations and that you, you get the radiation response for, them, for that current. We're going to do something similar in Einstein's equations, restricting ourselves to the to the uh, restricting ourselves to the limit in which the right hand side is small. So that once again Einstein's equations can be linearized, except they're not going to be linearized with no source on the right hand side. They'll be linearized with with a source on the right hand side. Okay, and there is only one subtlety that we will have to deal with in this process that we'll come to, as as I, as we go. So we want the uh, source term to be small uh, because otherwise it would make the uh, non-linear. Uh, exactly. Non -linear. Exactly. You see, in any non-linear problem, you will never have a general theory of radiation because source by source, you'll have to solve the problem yourself. You, you cannot. The, the think about a linear problem is you solve it in a basis and then by superposition you're done. You solve a Green's function problem, for instance. And then every source is smearing of that Green's function. So you can have a general theory of radiation. In a nonlinear equation, there's no such luck. Okay? So the best you can do for a general theory, of course, in general, what do you have to do? You have to solve Einstein's equations. 
and solving those equations will produce far away some linearized gravitational waves. That's true. But if you want to know how much of those waves are produced, in the linearized regime, we can produce a general thing. And in the nonlinear regime, you know, situation by situation, you're on your own. Okay? So we're going to just retreat to the linearized regime and try to address the question. Okay. So with that retreat, everything is very easy. Okay. Fine. What we're going to do is use the same gauge that we used in the study of linearized gravitons. Okay? We're going to use the same gauge that we used. And once again, we'll work with the psi variable, which is psi mn, uh, which was equal to hmn minus h by 2 uh, delta. Okay, and as an exercise, just closely connected to the exercise that we that we assigned when we were solving the linearized problem, the absence of um, uh, absence of uh, matter. It's you show that Einstein's equations in the same gauge, you know, all the same same notation, same gauge. Einstein's equations reduce to. Half box, I think what we call del square, uh, psi mn is equal to eight pi g by c to the four tau mn. Now, what is this tau mn? Tau mn. Uh, tau mn is a, contains a piece that is the linearized stress tensor. Okay, so this is just the stress tensor at linearized order. However, it also contains any piece from the left hand side that is a nonlinear that you've taken to the right hand side. Now, since we're dealing with the, the linearized problem, okay, you might think this is irrelevant. However, we have to be careful. We have to be careful because there are particular situations of great interest. Namely, let's say that you have one star orbiting around another. Okay, a small star orbiting around a big star, let's say. Okay? In this situation, five or six lectures ago, we had carefully looked, I mean, that's not, we had looked at the orders of magnitude of what t were. Do you remember, for instance, T00 was like order the mass. Okay? But T0i was like a velocity. And Tii was like velocity square. And remember that the Newtonian potential was also of order velocity square. So in a situation, so there is one situation in which all these guys are uniformly of the same order of magnitude. In which case you linearize, you keep only the linear part of the stress tensor, ignore everything on later. But there might be situations, in fact there are situations of great interest, in which there's a hierarchy of magnitudes in different components of the stress tensor. Like the situation we looked at. Okay, but T00 was, was in some sense one, T0i was epsilon and Tij was epsilon square. In this case, you remember that Tij had the same order of magnitude as the first correction in G00. Because the first correction in G00 was the potential. And the potential in Newtonian gravity is the same order of magnitude as V square because of energy conservation. Okay? So, in situ, 
So formally, we can just ignore everything on the right, everything that's non-linear. But in particular situations, we might encounter cases where it's inconsistent to keep things on the right hand side without also keeping analogous quantities on the left hand side. Is this clear? Okay. So this is the only, uh, this subtlety had no analog in the Maxwell theory and has no analog in very relativistic motion. There, you know, things are weak or strong depending on whether it's just an expansion of Newton's constant, for instance. Okay? But uh, in a situation in which part of the right hand side is caused by Newton's constant, because things are moving because of gravity. Okay? This expansion in Newton's constant and then keeping everything on the right hand side uh, is, is a bit subtle. The only safe thing. So if you, for instance, suppose I wanted to find, okay, so firstly, so with the subtlety in mind, let's proceed, but keeping the subtlety in mind. Do you understand the complication? Is it clear? Is the complication clear to everyone? That, that we are in danger of doing something wrong. And the danger is particularly severe for the following reason. You see, we're interested in the transverse traceless part of psi because we want the radiation. We've seen radiation is transverse and traceless. Okay? Now, transverse and traceless in particular does not involve the time. So it's like the ij part. So we would, be, we would be very tempted to just put the ij part of the stress tensor here and might be in danger of doing something wrong. Okay? Is this clear? So, what would be, you know, if we only are interested in the zero, zero component, then we can be naive. So, tau zero, zero receives no mixing from non-linearities at leading order. Okay? So, what we're going to do is do something very clever. Whenever we want to use tau ij, whenever we have a formula in which tau ij enters, what we're going to do is to use conservation of the right hand side to relate it to tau zero zero in a manner that I will now explain to you. Okay? That is the only subtlety. Otherwise, this analysis is entirely straightforward. Okay? So we'll have to keep the subtlety in mind uh, and proceed. So let's do that. Firstly, how do you, suppose I knew this thing, suppose I knew it. How do you integrate this equation? Well, all of you guys are totally experts at that, right? Okay, you've, you've been integrating this equation for the last <laughs> four years. <laughs> okay, it's exactly like you integrate uh, um, the equations of electromagnetism. Okay, so this equation uh, is integrated by the retarded Green's function. Okay, so it's 1 by r at the retarded point. Okay, so we have 1 by r and r is at the retarded point. I'm not even, I'm not even going to bother to explain all this, right? You, you, know, you know all this really well, right? So 1 by r, so, so psi mn is equal to 1 by r, which is function of x and x prime. tau mn of x prime <laughs> and it's this retarded business. You understand what I mean, right? That th these, these two are related by, by a light ray line of sight. This, this stuff you know, right? I'm not even explaining it to you very much. Okay? Um, as usual, we will be very, very far away. Okay? As usual, we'll be very, very far away. And so this, this 1 by r here will be essentially taken out. We'll do that in the, in, in the usual way. Okay? So we see that this thing becomes, uh, keeping uh, all the constants, is equal to minus 4g 
by c to the 4 r naught into tau m n evaluated at t minus r naught by c. Okay, so now this is a general formula, this is the answer for the radiation field, except for the subtlety that we have to deal with. And in order to deal with that subtlety, in order to uh, deal with that subtlety, we use the, this fact about this tau m n that we know. Namely, we know that, the, that this thing is covariantly conserved, but at linearized order that means that it is ordinarily conserved. Okay? So we have del m tau m n is equal to 0. Now I am separating out space and time. So all our subtleties are really relevant to the non-relativistic situation when these velocities are small compared to, uh, compared to 1. So let me separate out sp space and time. Um, so these equations split up into two equations. The first equation is del a tau a 0 is equal to 0. And this I will also split up into del 0 tau 0 0 plus del a tau a 0 0 0. So now a refers only to space. And the second such equation is the equation del, uh, I will keep this equation, this thing is spatial. So one thing is del 0 tau 0 b plus del a tau a b is equal to 0. Now I do the following strange but very useful manipulations. Consider tau 0 0 times x a. Now let me let me first start with sorry tau zero alpha let, let, let me start with tau zero a x b hmm. and consider del by del z x zero of this. Yeah, a and b separate indices. Okay. So now because this is a B index, the X0 derivative doesn't act on it. But it acts on this. And by using this equation, I can turn that into this is equal to minus uh, del C tau. Uh, Maybe I'll put this up. Yeah. And tau C A X B. But now I can write this as minus del C of tau C A X B plus the term which, which was this, which was delta B C, so tau B A. Okay? 
And so it follows that if I take, take these two equations and I integrate over all of space, I have integral dv of del by del x0 tau 0 a x b is equal to assuming that the source is localized, so that this vanishes at infinity, is equal to integral tau b a dv. So you see that within the integral sign, integrals over tau b a have been converted in, into, in, this is 0, huh? integral over tau 0 a um, with an x b coordinate. So this is useful because we, we're going to have, if we want the transverse parts of, the, of psi, we're going to need this integral in this formula here. But we've converted into a, formula, into a formula that has one zero and one a index. But we've done it this once, maybe we can do it again. Maybe we can get a formula which, ha which has integrals only of two zero indices. So let's try to do it again. Okay. So now what we're going to try to do is to look at del by del x0 of of tau 0 so now we'll look at del by del del by del x0 of tau 0 0 okay times x a x b So we use the same idea, this x0 hitting this guy, okay, this x0 hitting this guy is replaced by del c tau 0 c x a x b with a minus sign. Okay, but once again what we can do is to write this as minus del c of exactly tau 0 c x a x b plus tau 0 a x b plus tau 0 b x a Once again, we take this and integrate it. Once again, we throw away the total derivative. So under the integral sign, we see that integral del by del x0 of tau 0, 0, x a, x b is equal to integral tau 0 a, x b plus tau 0 b, x a. But you know, these up and down indices here are related because we are raising and lowering with respect to eta. These up and down indices in space are the same and time differ by a minus sign. So if this formula is true, a similar formula is also true with a replaced by b. Okay? So this quantity is the same as half of this quantity symmetrized with a and b. Okay? But half of this quantity symmetrized, that quantity symmetrized was this. So that's same as half of this, you know, with the extra d by d x0. And so we find that integral tau ab is equal to half del 0 squared integral tau 0 0, uh, I may have got the sign wrong now because I've raised and lowered some zeros. I'll check that against natural Let me check the sign. I've got the sign wrong. You can check that sign. 
Do you see? Do you see what I've done? I've taken this quantity, run this formula, run a similar formula with a, repl a replaced by b, summed and done half of that. Then use this formula to replace it by this. Okay, so what we see is that you know making appropriate assumptions. The assumption is basically that the source dies off at infinity, so you can ignore total derivative term. The effective source for radiation for the transfer traceless part can entirely be written in terms of the zero zero component of this stress tensor, but not the zero zero component itself. The zero zero component weighted with x a and x b. Now, in electromagnetism, in electromagnetism, you guys may remember a formula that looks sort of like this when you're studying Coulomb's law. When you're studying Coulomb's law, you get f and you're trying to find the electric field of a distribution of charges far away. Actually, the similar formulas for radiation as well, but you're probably less familiar with them. Uh, when you're studying Coulomb's law, when you're looking at the distribution of electric fields far away, uh, first you get a, ta a term that is just 1 by r times charge. Then you get a term that's 1 by r square times a dipole moment. That's charge times x a. Then you get a what charge term that's 1 by r cube times charge times x a x b. That's a quadrupole moment. Actually, you have to remove the trace part. The part that will be physically relevant for us will be the trace removal part because we're interested in that traceless. But anyway, so anyway, uh, ignoring that for the, for the moment. Huh? This quantity in that context is called the quadrupole moment of the charge distribution. So it's natural to call this the quadrupole moment of the energy distribution of the stress tensor. What we see here is this remarkable fact that in gravity the radiation is determined not by the net charge. Of course the coulombic field of gravity of radiation, I mean not of radiation, the coulombic field, the 1 by r fall off of the Newtonian potential is determined by the net mass. This is something we saw long ago. But we're not interested in the Coulombic field. We're not interested in just the tail, the 1 by r tail. We're interested in radiation. And we see that the radiation here is determined by the quadrupole moment of the stress tensor and in fact the second, derivative, second time derivative. Note that the radiation field is 1 by r. The analogy with the electrostatics was incomplete. There was no real analogy. I, I brought up that electrostatics just to remind you that this is called a quadrupole moment. But that was a static question. This is a dynamic question. The analogy should be with electromagnetic radiation. In that case, there was a dipole type formula for electromagnetic radiation. Okay, it has to do with the fact that the photon has been one. Here we have a quadrupole type formula for gravitational radiation. And you see that basically what we find is radiation is determined by the quadrupole of the, of the mass distribution. In energy, but, energy. but mass in the non relativistic limit, and the second time derivative thereof. Okay? Now, um, great. Uh, we will see as we, when we understand the theory of energy in general relativity, that the energy of an electromagnetic wave is proportional to h dot. This is not very surprising. This is the analog of the statement that in, sorry, not electric, gravitational, uh, is proportional to h dot. This is the analog of the statement that in electromagnetism, a wave has energy proportional to k. Okay, so the fact that this thing itself has two time derivatives. Okay, so that the amplitude of the wave is four time derivatives. Okay, then plus extra factors of derivatives uh, from converting the amplitude of the wave to energy means that the dependence of the energy radiated by a gravitational source has a very large number of deriv time derivatives, five or six, six in some way. 
depending on whether you're going on intensity or net energy radiated, five or six. Okay, but a very large number of time derivatives involved in the game, which is basically the statement that electromagnetic radiation is small. Because when, let's say you've got, you've got something moving, then the time derivative will be proportional to the velocity. Every velocity is measured in units of the speed of light. Okay, so we've got V by C to some high power, five or six depending on what question you're interested in. Okay, so gravitational radiation will be small as we will see in detail when we understand how to calculate the energy. Okay, but it's small but non-zero. Now we will calc, uh, we will perhaps, yeah, we should set that the sequence of that. Uh, but we will, in the remaining more interesting part of the course where we do more interesting things than the basic stuff we've been talking about. Um, uh, one of the things we will definitely do is understand energy momentum, understand how to calculate it. And one of the problems I will then give you uh, is look at a star moving around another star and calculate uh, how much energy it loses per, time, per unit time and how by energy conservation that, that causes the star to spiral into its parent star. Now I say this because this, this kind of calculation when you do, compute the energy loss then allows you to compute the effect of that energy loss on the orbit of a star. Now that energy loss is small, but you know these stars, sometimes you have stars that are moving not too differently from the speed of light, so it needn't be very small. And can have observable consequences. And in fact, these observable consequences in a, for a particular binary system were tracked in great detail by I think Hulse and Taylor. Um, and they measured the change in the orbit precisely enough to, you know, with great precision to see that it was following exactly the change in the orbit that you would get if you believe the radiation formula we've just derived and use the energy emission formula that we've not yet derived. Um, and so, uh, why, why, why people, including the Nobel Committee, you know, in the citation for this year's gravitational waves say, this, you know, this Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of gravitational waves. That's of course true. In some sense, there was no real doubt that gravitational waves existed. Experimentally. I mean, very few theorists doubted it. But, uh, uh, but even experimentally, there was no real doubt because we've actually seen them. Not in the seeing the waves themselves, but in seeing the effect of the back reaction of the wave in a precisely measured mean, a way that's much more precise than LIGO. Okay. So, okay, there was already one, one Nobel Prize in gravitational waves. This is for the more direct detection. And that's very reasonable. But just to say that we already knew from this formula that gravity waves actually exist. Not because we could see the waves, but we could see the impact of the waves on the thing that was emitted. Yeah, okay, so uh, I'll postpone that problem to when we've understood how to calculate, we've understood energy in, in more detail. Uh, and then we'll go. Okay. I think this is all I wanted to say about gravitational uh, radiation. Are there questions or comments? Questions or comments? What is the order of speed? Order in what? T00 will be taken to be order epsilon. It's, it's in the sense that it is small. It is producing an H00 that by itself is small. Yes, it's taken. If, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's order epsilon, therefore it'll produce a back reaction in H that is order epsilon. This is a linear equation that you have. Okay, now, uh, great. With this, we've, con we've completed our first run through. Um, general relativity in that we've discussed the three main phenomena that I think is manda mandatory to discuss in such a course, namely orbits around a Schwarzschild potential, um, cosmology, and gravitational radiation. Now we want to go back, now in the rest of the course we will go back, uh, go back to general relativity and try to understand many aspects of it in more, uh, more detail, okay? What we'll do in some order, um, depending partly on my tastes and partly on yours. Um, uh, we will discuss black hole physics in more detail. We will discuss 
the formal structure of general relativity. General relativity is of an initial value problem and things like that in, in more detail. We'll discuss energy momentum and we can discuss aspects of cosmology in more detail, for instance, the theory of inflation. Um, uh, before ending this lecture, I just wanted the input from you guys. What, what, if there's any aspect of the subject that you would particularly like to, like to discuss, we can take that into account. So there's any, uh, we're going to now go through a more, less structured free, uh, fl free walk through the subject to, uh, to hear many more interesting things. If there's any particular, there's no canonical structure for this. If there's any particular thing you guys are interested in, I, I can take that into account. So anything anyone particularly about, wants to hear about? Null congruence, did you say black holes? Yeah. What did you say? Black holes, okay, so that's similar. Okay, yes, the theory of, we can hear more about the theory of black holes, which would be interesting. Inert in general relativity. Good. So let, let me make a list. Somebody, if you can write, take down this list so that we won't forget. This is the same as your question. Uh, what? Gauge formulation. You know, general relativity is based on a on a on a gauge gauge principle. The gauge principle, loosely speaking, is general covariance. But you know, in what we've done, it doesn't really feel like a gauge theory. Where are the field strengths? Maybe the curvature has some sense of field strength, but you know, where where is the gauge field? Now there is a way of writing the equations of general relativity that makes its structural association with the gauge symmetry very clear. And this also allows you to, as a practical payoff, to couple general relativity to spinners, which if you think about it, we don't yet know how to do. We don't yet know how to do because what we've, what we've understood how to deal with are tensors. Now tensors are representations that if you think of SOD comma one, we have representations of SOD comma one that can be built out of taking products of vectors. All such things we can easily promote to generally covariant objects, because those are tensors. However, there are some representations of SOD comma one that are not vectors, they're spinner representations. And it's hard to know what it means to promote those two tensors. So how do we, how do we understand Dirac's equations in general? Uh, so, a practical payoff, so the, the, the way of doing that is to understand general relativity as a structural rather than a slightly deeper way. So, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this. Okay. Um, uh, black holes, we come. Uh, let's also look at um, initial value problem. And there you go. That's the idiom for we'll, 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 we'll study the structure of the equations of general relativity. Uh, then we have black hole physics in body. And event horizons. Inflation. And, may, and we should do, do conserve charges. Energy, momentum, oh. anything. What, what does it mean for a charge to be conserved in general? Okay, uh, fine. If anyone has a, has a suggestion for a topic, 
at a later point we can incorporate this. In some order we'll go through. What? Good. Good. Anything else? Derivation of a karmic. So. <laughs> Anything else? We can at least discuss the structure of the theorems. Sure. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So let's 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 start on this in some order and uh, see how it goes. Um, Pranoy, could I request you send us on an email with this list so we have it in mind? Okay, great. Thank you.